you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to uh, Leviticus 23. I haven't asked the pastor question that I'm going to hold on to till next week. Um, I want to get into the Feast of Trumpets. Now we've been working through the Feast in Leviticus 23. And uh, we have seen that the spring feasts, the four feasts of spring, have been fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ. We see that he was the Paschal Lamb. We see that he was... The unleavened bread without sin. We see that he was the first fruits raised from the dead. A new type. A type that would never know death again. And we see the birth of the church. At Pentecost. So then at the end of the spring feasts. There's a period of months. Where there are no feasts. And if we look at this prophetically, that would indicate the age that we are now in, the church age. Because the church age will end with his second coming. And we believe that the fall feasts will be completed, the prophecies in the fall feasts will be completed with his second coming. So, right now, we're in that period of in-between. Okay? And we're looking forward... To the fulfillment of the fall feasts. And I think it's significant that the first feast in fall. Uh, feast in fall. Is the feast of trumpets. Because when Jesus comes again. There will be a loud trumpet blast. Now. We blow the shofar every morning to start our service. I dare say there's not many of you that miss it. <laughs> okay. When, when it's blown, it gets your attention. But this trumpet blast is going to be a blast that the whole world hears. Okay? So we're going to take a look at the fall feast, starting with the Feast of Trumpets. Now, does anybody know the Hebrew name for this festival, this feast? Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Interestingly enough, Rosh Hashanah, by the way, if you look at your bulletin, okay, the Hebrew on top, um, Christy and Mackenzie and Thaddeus have been working on Hebrew, and they each tested themselves to see if they could read this this morning. Um, what do you guys want to read that out of the Hebrew? Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Now in Hebrew, they didn't put oftentimes the vowels in there. And, and on this, there are no vowel markings. So we don't know what the vowels are in between the, the characters. But Rosh Hashanah, as we know it, is the head of the year. Okay? And we're going to dive into this because you're going to see, uh, we've talked about over and over again, how the Jews would take a directive, a command of God, and then they'd erect barriers around it to keep themselves safe. And then generations later, they would erect further out barriers so that they might not offend the barrier, so they wouldn't offend God. And then generations later, they would erect another barrier that they would not offend the second barrier, thereby offending the first barrier, thereby offending God. And we're going to now, a lot of us look at that and we go, oh, those silly Jews. We do the same thing. We do the same thing. We take God's word and we go, okay, how do I apply it in my life? Now, if you stop there, that's not a problem. It's when I go, how do I apply this to your life that we start running into issues? Okay? So there are certain things that God, it's black and white. There are certain things that God has left a lot of gray. Okay? So we're going to get into this festival today, this feast. Um, does anybody know on what day, according to the Jewish calendar, this feast falls? First of Tishri. The first of Tishri. 
Okay? So, we, we looked through the calendar. You should have a calendar that I've given you. I've, I've handed them out a couple different times just so you can kind of keep an eyeball on where things happen. Now, Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. Um, if you remember back when we looked at the Feast of Passover, we read that God declared that the, the month of Passover was to them to be a new year. They were supposed to start the clock all over again that month. And it was to be the new year, and then they would go to the 14th and, and then Passover, and, and things would move from there. So if that's the case, why in the world do we have a festival now that is called the head of the year? Any clues? Anybody got an idea why we have a second new year? Anyone? I'll tell you why. Because the Jews answered their own questions. Okay, we're, we're going to dive into this. Uh, so let's take a look at Leviticus 23. Um, <clears throat> starting down in verse 23, you see the title of your... Does anybody have a title there that says something different than the Feast of Trumpets? The festival of trumpets, okay? Okay. You know what's interesting about this is some say feast, some say festival. The, the Hebrew word here for feast or festival is actually appointed time. When God said, you're going to celebrate this, he said, this, this, at this appointed time, this is what you do. Okay. So feast, festival, those are okay terms. But, but we know that God was directing a very specific time for things to take place. And that's going to cause some problems. We've already seen some problems in some of the other feasts because he says, well, so many days after the Sabbath. And, and they went, well, oh, oh, which Sabbath does he mean? Because we have the Sabbath on the Saturday that is a weekly Sabbath. But then there are other ones that, that according to the, the rules he's given us, also qualify for being a Sabbath. And, and that led to a lot of confusion and, and it gets worse here. But they came up with the solution, okay? So, verse 23, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, seventh month being Tishri, on the first day of the month you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpet, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. And you pre shall present a food offering to the Lord. Okay? So here we have the, the introduction of the Feast of Trumpets. Did you notice what it said that they were supposed to do? Because see, when we look at this, it's actually laid out as, as a fairly simple directive. It says, um, verse 24, You shall observe a day of solemn rest. Okay, and in verse 25, he clarifies that saying, you're not going to do any ordinary work. Okay, this, this qualifies it as a Sabbath. Okay, so you, you shall have a day of solemn rest, and, and as part of that, you don't do any ordinary work. Then he says, uh, this is a memorial proclaimed with the blast of trumpets. Okay, now what's interesting here is the word for trumpets doesn't mean shofar. As a matter of fact, that word doesn't mean a specific type of trumpet. It, it actually means by the blowing of a horn. Okay. Well, in Israel, their trumpet was the shofar. So they took that and they said, okay, it's going to be the shofar. Do, does anybody know of any other trumpets that were blown in Israel besides the shofar? Can anybody think of one? The silver trumpets, that's right. God required of Israel when they were in the desert that they make two silver trumpets. And they were blown to announce when a gathering was taking place, when they were packing up to leave, when they were going to settle down. So, so we know that there were other types of trumpets that were available, but shofar is what they used. Okay. Now, a lot of people believe when Jesus comes back, it's going to be to the sound of a shofar. I don't. I think it's going to be to the sound of that silver trumpet. 
because he's calling his people to gather. But I'm okay if I'm wrong. So long as I hear a horn blowing, you know, I'm jumping. I'm going. I'm not going to stand down here and say, uh-uh, oh, not till the silver one blows. No, okay? So, so don't let that trip you up, all right? So the horn is blown. The third thing, a holy convocation. What is a holy convocation? Holy yeah, a holy gathering. Yeah. Oh, a, a, the, the, a gathering of the ones that have been called out, that have been separated out. That's us. This, this, this right here is a holy convocation. Okay? So three things that were laid out. And then if you look down in verse 25, there's one other component here that is to be added. He says, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. Okay, so here we have the steps of the things that are to be done on the Feast of Trumpets. But before we get into it, I want to go over some of the names that the Hebrews have for this feast. Okay, so go ahead and put uh, the first one up if you would please. <clears throat> An offering made by fire. Yep, a burnt offering. We'll get to that in a minute. Because there is another passage that clarifies what type of offering. Okay. I'm not even going to try and pronounce this properly. Zikaron and Trua. Now, this is, this is a funny thing. Go ahead and put the second one up. Okay. Yom Trua. Now, the first one we see, it's a memorial of triumph. The second one, the, the difference being that we have Zikaron, which is a memorial, and Yom, which is a day. Why is one blowing and one trying? Because a lot of Hebrew is, is a picture. They use words to give you a picture of what they're trying to say. And the blowing of the trumpets, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, is a memorial of triumph. To remember something that, that God has done. Okay? The, the word trua is, is the blowing. And whatever type of horn, that would be it. Okay? So let's go to the third one. Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. We're going to get into this a little bit further down, um, but we're going to see why they look at Rosh Hashanah as the head of the year. Just for clarification, according to the religious calendar, okay, the first of the year is um, the month of, of Passover. But according to the civil calendar, it is the month of Tishri at Rosh Hashanah. Okay? Because, um, well, well, we'll get into that a little bit further. So there's, there's two New Years, if you will. The religious New Year and the civil New Year. Okay? So, Rosh Hashanah. The next one. Yom Hazikaron, the day of remembrance. We go ahead and do the fifth one. Yom Hadin, the day of judgment. Okay? So, the day of remembrance, the Jews call this the day of remembrance because they, are, they believe that this is a preparation time for Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Okay? And, and we're, we're going to see they take this very seriously because they are remembering their sin. It's a call to repentance. And we're going to see there's kind of a whole thing wrapped up in this repentance. And, and they're remembering that the day of atonement is coming and they've got to get themselves right with God that they might receive the atonement. Okay? And then the day of judgment, the Jews believe that on this day they will be judged. This is a day that God is calling them back to their roots, back to their faith, back to Judaism, because they are getting prepared for the Day of Atonement. All right? So these are the five names that are used. Uh, Rosh Hashanah is actually used in the Scripture uh, for Ezek in Ezekiel 40, verse 1, but it's not used in relation to this feast, ironically. Okay? Nowhere in Scripture is this feast called Rosh Hashanah. Okay? That's, that's something that the Jews applied later. All right, so let's go ahead and go forth. Um, biblical practices. Um, if you look at the, the passage, this celebration is to be one day. Well, this, this caused some problems. 
Because when the Jews were dispersed, when they went into exile, they didn't know at the places they were living when the day started in Jerusalem, in Israel. Because the day started when you were able to see three stars visible. Okay? So there was some concern as to are we doing it too early? Are we doing it too late? How do we cover this? The Jews came up with an answer. They call it Yom Parichta, the long day. Okay? To make sure everybody was safe, to make sure everybody was covered, they changed this festival to be two days. Okay? So that you could celebrate it over the span. If you got the day in there, you were good. Okay? So, so the Jews trying to make sure they, they upheld the, the, the least stroke of a pen of the law, stretched it out. And they count those two days as one day. All right? Um, you see how they're kind of adding to? See how they're adding to? They, they take this premise that it has to be the day according to Israel. Okay? But Scripture doesn't say that, does it? It just says on this day. All right? So we're going to see, as they start building these barriers, building these protective measures, we're going to see where they come to this place where it's like, wow! All of that you pulled out of these couple of verses to protect themselves, to make sure that they didn't in any way violate God, God's laws. All right? So it was a one-day celebration that they stretched it out to two days. It was to be a day of rest with no ordinary work. It was a day of special sacrifices. Now, we're going to see here in a minute when we look at the scriptures that these sacrifices were to be in addition to the regular daily sacrifices. Just as when all the other feasts, when God called a sacrifice, He said this is in addition to the daily sacrifice. It doesn't take the place of, it's in addition to. And uh, number four, uh, it was celebrated by the blowing of the trumpet, the blowing of the horn, except on the Sabbath. Now here's something that will trip your brains. Okay? They could not blow the horn on the Sabbath because the horn blower would have to carry the horn. And that would violate... The Sabbath. You're not supposed to do any ordinary work. No horn carrying. Okay? So if, if this feast fell on the Sabbath, there was no horn blowing. The horn blowing would be put off till the next day. But did you look at the command for this day? No ordinary work. So how could they carry the horn any time on this feast? If that's an ordinary work thing, how could you ever get... you got to place the horn the day before and walk up and blow it. You can't... How does that even work? We're not going to do it on the Sabbath, but God just declared this day is a Sabbath day. No ordinary work. A solemn, a holy convocation. Wow. Okay? And we're not even getting into some of the minutiae. I actually cut probably a page and a half of the way the Jews celebrate this. I cut it out. Because there's nowhere near enough time. Alright? So, let's look at uh, some of the Jewish practices. The month before Tishri is what? Does anybody know? Oh, I'm going to bend your brains. Elul. Yes. The month of Elul. The first part of the preparation for this feast is the month of Elul. Starting on the first of Elul, they would begin a 28-day period of preparation <clears throat> where they would begin getting themselves ready for the Feast of Trumpets. And, and really, the Feast of Trumpets was just kind of a pausing point to moving on to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Okay, So they would take the entire month of Elul to get themselves ready. All right. Now, just, I'm just going to draw a, a quick parallel here. How many people in here had, had come out of the Catholic Church, have ever been in the Catholic Church? Put them up high. Holy smokes. Wow. That's a lot of people. Okay. <clears throat> Does anybody know the season that we're moving into um, in the Catholic Church? 
Lent. 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 When does it start? Uh, the first. <clears throat> this coming Wednesday. Ash Wednesday. Okay. And it goes until. I thought it was the 14th. 14th. Yeah, February 14th. No. Ash Wednesday. We're talking about Ash Wednesday, which is the start of the season. Okay. And you get the mountain. Okay. They are taking this, the Jewish practices, and they're customizing it to the Catholic faith. And they take a, I'm giving something up, something. Uh, when I was in middle school, the school that I went to was predominantly Hispanic. And there were a lot of Catholic people. And I, 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 I was never a part of the Catholic Church. Um, I don't really understand a lot of why they do what they do. Um, but I remember a friend of mine gave up her boyfriend for Lent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know how ready he was to come back after Lent. Um, you know, but, but see, the, the Catholic Church adopted a, almost everything that they do. They took out of the Hebrew Scriptures. And they said, oh, since you failed, we're taking it, we're making it our own. Okay? And, and then there's this period of preparation. Now, um, okay, I just lost the... Mardi Gras. Does anybody know what Mardi Gras is? Oh, come on. Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> Everybody in here should know what Mardi Gras is. Even if you, if you watch any TV. Yeah, All right, party. Dennis, please tell us. It's the last big party before that begins. That's exactly right. This is your day to go out and blow it. Blow it big so you have something to repent of. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Okay. So you see that there's, there's a pattern developing here. All right. So the month of Elul, they're setting themselves up. They're building up to Yom Kippur. They're taking that month and they're getting themselves ready. Got, I, okay. This month, I, I got to give up cursing. I got to give up the, the drunkenness. I got to give up the, oh my gosh, what am I going to do this month? Please, Yom Kippur, get here quickly so I can get back to my life. But that's exactly what they were doing. Because you read in the Old Testament, they were keeping these festivals. And they would turn around and they'd go home and they'd go up on the rooftop and worship the, the starry host. They'd go out to the tree and worship uh, Asherah and Baal. They would then go down to the valley and they would worship Molech with the sacrifice of infants. And they kept the feast. And then, oh, we got to prepare ourselves. But, but when, you're, when your hearts are divided and your loyalties are divided, God will not accept part. It's all or it's nothing. He calls himself a jealous God. He will not share with anyone. Okay? So, the month of Elul, they're preparing themselves. They come up to the month of Tishri. Um, the next thing they call it, let's, let's talk about the head of the year. <clears throat> they call it the head of the year because according to Jewish belief, this was the day, the first of Tishri was the day that God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, Kind of a significant day, don't you think? Kind of a day you would want to commemorate? Kind of a day you would want to remember and celebrate? Because if he didn't do that, we wouldn't be here. Okay? So they called it um, the head of the year because God created the heavens and the earth. Go ahead and go on to the next one. It was used for the Sabbath year count. Okay? Remember that when God called Israel into Canaan, he told them, Six years you will work the land, but the seventh you will give it a Sabbath rest. You will let the land rest. Now you want to do some interesting math? Look up the, the number of years that Israel failed to do this and the number of years they spent in exile. And it comes out to work out that they, God was taking back, he actually tells them, I'm taking back all of my Sabbath years. You'll be gone for 70 years. Okay? So, 
the start for the Sabbath year count was the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. Okay? They would start that count there, and then they would come up to the six years. At the beginning of the seventh year, the land lies fallow. Okay? Let's go to the next one. Uh, it was also used for the year of Jubilee count. Uh, does anyone know what, <clears throat> why we call it Jubilee? That was what was how it was celebrated, yes, but we actually get the word jubilee from um, Jobel, or Jobel, however you say it in Hebrew, which means horn. Okay? And the horn would blow, when the horn would blow on the first of Tishri, all indebtedness for the Hebrew people was wiped away. Okay? Um, when God gave them their lands, they were their lands in perpetuity. If they got into a financial bind, one of their um, kinsmen would come and would purchase the land from them. There was a formula whereby they would determine the value of the land because if he got it for the majority of 50 years, then, then he paid more for it. If he got it for just a couple of years, then he got less for it. Okay, But when that horn blew, all of the land was supposed to revert back to the family that God gave it to. Okay? Slaves were to be set free. If you had a Hebrew um, got in trouble, he said, you know, I, I, I can't pay my debt. Can I come and work for you? And they would enter into a service position. That, you know, we, we look at slave and we go, uh, we have horrible uh, memories from school of, of black people being whipped and scourged and, and all kinds of horrible things. Um, actually, if you read scripture, when God talks about slaves, he gives very careful measure to how they are to be treated. Okay? Uh, he doesn't just say, do with them what you will. Okay? So if he came and he said, I, 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 I can't pay the debt, I'll enter into service with you. If he had not worked off that debt by the year of Jubilee, he was set free and the debt was expunged. Okay? All indebtedness in the land, every 50 years, was wiped out. Okay? Now, that's the way it was supposed to work. That's not really the way it did work. You read in some places where um, a leader would rise up and tell them to set the, their prisoners, set their slaves free. And uh, we, we think about this with uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, he told them, you know, set the, set the slaves free. And they said, okay, we'll set them free. And then a couple days later, when they had to do their own work, they went out and grabbed them again and brought them back in and said, no, 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 no. Uh, I, I revoke that. You're still my slave. Okay. So... <clears throat> The start of the count for the year of Jubilee was from this day. Uh, let's go ahead and go on to the next one. <clears throat> it was the start for the counting of the trees. The counting of the trees, what? You mean like every so many years they had to go out and count the trees? No. God said when you come into the land and you plant a tree, you have to wait three years technically in the fourth year before you can consume any of its fruit. Okay? So you plant a tree, you wait till the, the first of Tishri, and then you start counting the years, and after the third year has been completed, whatever fruit that tree grows at that point, you can then harvest and consume. Okay? You, you're like, wow. I mean, this is kind of a significant day for them. Why three years with the fruit? I don't know. There's a lot of stuff God has chosen not to share with me. He just keeps to himself. We, he and I are going to have long conversations because there's a lot of stuff that I read and I go, huh, I wonder why he did that. Okay. And then the last one, this was also the date used for the tithe of produce. We see in Deuteronomy that every third year, all of the agriculture, they were to take a tenth of it and that tenth was to be given to the Levites and to the sojourner and to the poor. Okay? And this date was the start. They would count off of this date. So one year, two year, three year, the tithe is due. Okay? So when, when the third year passed, that tithe would come, it would go to the Levites, and they would also keep some to give to the poor and the sojourner. Okay? So... Some of, these were some of the Jewish practices based off of Scripture. Let's go um, forward a little bit. 
the blowing of the trumpet. Why? Why would they blow a trumpet? We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us why. God did not see fit to give them a reason. He just said, blow the trumpet. Blow the horn. Okay? There was no reason why. But the Jews being Jews, they weren't content with not having an answer. So they came up with lists of things to explain why. Now these are in the Talmud. These are in their writings. They're not in Scripture. Okay? Now, again, you look at Scripture and, and we see that there were... Uh, one of the divisions between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was what was God's word. The Sadducees believed that it was the law and the prophet and the writings, the Hebrew Bible. That was it. The Pharisees believed that the traditions, the oral traditions that were later compiled into the Talmud, uh, Talmud and the, the Mishnah, those also were writings from God and they were to be given the same credibility. Okay? Um, in the Protestant church, we believe in sola scriptura, that only the Bible is the word of God. <clears throat> People in other faiths, I know the Catholics, also believe that the writings of their uh, priests and their bishops and their popes and their cardinals, those are given equal value or, or some measure of value to, to kind of bring them up to the same level as the scriptures. Okay? See again how they, they followed exactly what the Jews were doing. Okay. So, <clears throat> let's look at uh, a couple things about the blowing of the trumpet. The purpose. There are three reasons that the Jews feel that the trumpet should be blown. First, a call to repentance. Okay. The day of atonement is coming. And so, they're calling all of the Jews back to their faith and to repentance. Because if you go into the Day of Atonement in a not good place, some bad things are going to happen to you, according to their, their, their teachings. Number two, to remind the Jews of their covenant with God. Okay, when that, that shofar blows, it's to be a reminder to the Jews that you are a people that God has covenanted with. Of all the people in the world, He chose us. To give a covenant to, to, to enter into covenant with. All right? And then the third reason, this one kind of surprised me, to confuse Satan as he attempts to accuse them. The understanding would be that when the blows the horns start blowing, there's so much noise, there's such a cacophony, there's there's so much going on that it confuses the devil and he can no longer accuse them before God. Okay? <clears throat> Let's go on a little bit more. The meaning. Okay, now we see the, the purpose. Now we're looking at the meaning. Um, if the meaning was to symbolize the regathering of Israel when the Messiah comes. Now that's kind of kind of key right there. That's something you want to kind of file away in your brain. Because this is a belief that they have had for millennia. That when that trumpet blows, it's going to signify the coming of Messiah. Remember what I said about the trumpet blowing? When he comes back, we're looking for the same thing. Okay? We're looking for the same thing. We're looking for a trumpet to be blown. Um, number two, it symbolizes the resurrection of the dead. Okay? When the trumpet blown, uh, Paul writes, when the trumpet blows, what? The dead will rise first. Whew. And then we who are left... Will, run, will be taken up with them, will be snatched away, will be raptured. Okay? Number three. <clears throat> oh, man. Ah! Uh, okay, this is, the, this is the one I told you I was going to get to. Um, on this day when the trumpet blows, three books are open in heaven. The book of the righteous. If you had lived a perfectly righteous life, then your name was written into this book. It's also known as the book of life. And you would be guaranteed <coughs> life for another year. Okay? Then there's the second book that's called the book of the wicked. And if you were not a righteous person for the whole year, if you just blew up, you had a bad year. Okay? And you did not repent. 
Your name was written in the book of the wicked, which is also called the book of the dead. And you would, be, it, would it was believed that you would die at some point that year. Okay? But there's a third book. Okay? Because not everybody is wicked and yet completely righteous. So they have a third book. It's called the book of in between. <laughs> okay? Absolutely. The book of in between. Okay? So uh, in the book of in between, if you are neither in the righteous or the wicked, um, you, your name was written in the book of in between and you were given 10 days. Do, 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 do. Okay, the 10 days from the blowing of the trumpet to Yom Kippur to repent, to get your act straight, to repent, to make things right with, good, with God so that when the day of Yom Kippur came, your sins would be atoned for. Okay, they got all the bases covered. All right, I'm going to stop here. Um, I didn't even get to some of the more interesting stuff. Um, if anybody would like a copy of my notes, let me know. I, I skipped over quite a bit. Uh, if you didn't, weren't able to keep up with the scripture references or whatever, just let me know. Father, we bless you today and we thank you. Because, Father, we are waiting for that trumpet to blow. You have promised. Father, we are not here with no purpose, with no end. But, Father, you have said there is an end coming. And while it's an end to this life, it's the beginning of eternity. It's the beginning of something so much better. It's the beginning of God tabernacling with man, where you will come down and live among us. And Father, as we wait for that trumpet to blow, let us not be idle. Help us to be busy about the Master's work that we would be good stewards of all that he has left in our care. We ask, Father, your blessing over this word. We ask, Father, that you would give good seed and it would find good soil and it would grow and bear much fruit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.